Lord Jesus, thank you for your people. Thank you that they're here. Thank you that they love you and each other. That when they came here this morning, they didn't come here just to listen and leave. They came here to fellowship, to grow in you, to see how could they can love on each other and to be your people to each other while they're here. God, I pray you'll guard that in this church. Guard that love jealously. Teach them to honor that and to to look for ways to maintain that so that they can be your hands and feet to the people who are around them, to each other. Lord, I pray for that in your name. Amen. Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but people are broken. I would love that. Thank you. I have an epic slideshow. Three points. Okay. (laughs) That's right. We're out of here early. No, okay. (laughs) We are broken people. Ever since Adam and Eve broke their relationship with God and with each other, God got things moving to restore that relationship, to restore us to what he wanted us to be. Interestingly enough, he wants us to take part in that restorative process. See, is fascinating to me that when God looked at a world that had rejected him and a world that said no, God's response was not, I'm going to say this and please forgive me if it's too far, screw you world. It was, I love you. I'm going to do something to try to restore our relationship. Totally different mindset. God was so involved in bringing about the restoration that he sent Jesus into the world. Now, the last time I was here, I would have pointed up here to the cross, right? It's over there, guys. Um, He sends Jesus into the world, but here's the cool part. God sends Jesus not just to save our souls, not just to get us to heaven, which is not some cloud thing with harps, right? It's to be with God forever in a restored relationship, in his presence. That's what heaven is. God sends Jesus into the world. Jesus sends us with the same mission. What I want to show you today is that God wants to use you as an agent of restoration for his people and for this world. God wants to take you And he wants you to find broken people, to take them and help make them whole. It's not just about getting to heaven. God's got a whole plan for people that we get to be a part of. Today we're going to look at a a particular passage. This particular passage is going to be very familiar to you. The minute I tell it to you, you're going to go, ha, ha. Most people can quote this without a problem, right? But here's the thing. Today, I want you to look at it through a completely different lens. Not how do I get to heaven? What was God's mission? What is God's mission towards you? And what does God want you to experience and to take part in as he takes that mission, not just to you, but through you into the world? That's what we want to look at today. So today, we're going to look at three principles that we can learn from Jesus about how to engage in this ministry God has of restoration. Now, how many of you know John 3, 16 and 17? Somebody quote it for us. Anybody? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Very important second verse. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved through him. God's, Christ's first coming was a mission of restoration, not condemnation. We're still part of that mission. And so what I want to do today is very quickly, I'm not going to go crazy. I don't have a super systematic theology outline like I would normally have. I want to focus this on Christ. Because did you ever notice that God has a mission of restoration? Who fulfilled the mission? Christ, right? Christ came. 
Christ did the mission. Christ took it to the next level. And what we're going to see today, as I said, is that Christ then looked at his disciples and said, I'm sending you. That's our mission. So let's look at Christ, John 3, 16 through 17. But we're going all over the Bible, so have your Bibles ready, okay? Um, and I wanted just to show you three things I learned from Jesus as I looked into this ministry of restoration that we have. First, God cares enough to actively seek to restore broken relationships. Do you know that the God who's currently sitting in heaven, Jesus Christ, was sitting there before he came here? And when we messed up, when we broke our relationship with him, do you know what he could have done? He could have said, oh well, you come back to me, right? When a kid breaks his relationship with his parents, who usually has to restore that relationship? Mom and dad. Who should have to restore that relationship? The kid, right? God, we break our relationship with God, what does God do? God decides to be the parent. God steps in and says, I'm going to restore not just that relationship, but that person's life, their wholeness, their completeness, all the plans I have for them, and then I'm going to use them to do the same for other people. That's his goal. Church, as we're going to see today, your role in this community in this world, in your families, is to be God's agent of restoration. So, turn with me to Luke 15, 1 through 7. Luke 15, 1 through 7. I hope you, what I want to do this morning is to give you the vision of God for what he is trying to do in this world. Luke 15, 1 through 7. Now, pay attention as we read this. God's first point of restoration is you. And then he moves on. But check this out. Now, the, verse 1, 15, 1 through 7. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to, to hear him. Who? The broken people, right? The tax collectors and sinners. They're national traitors. They're sinners. They're outcasts in their community. And the Pharisees, the religious elite, whose job it is to be God's representatives in the Jewish nation, what's their response? This man receives sinners and eats with them. What's their job? Their job's to help people move back to be restored in a relationship with the Lord. What are they doing? The exact opposite, right? Jesus' perspective. Verse 3, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends, his neighbors, saying to them, that dumb sheep... No, no, that's not it. No. Nope. Rejoice with me. I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. What's the point? The one was worth the effort. The one who, uh, get this in your mind, okay, think through this. You're a shepherd, right? You've been entrusted with someone else's sheep. You're out in the wilderness, right? One sheep goes away. Do you go look for that one sheep or take care of the 99? Let's be practical here, right? That one sheep is toast. I'm sorry, pragmatically speaking, I'm not leaving one, 99 sheep to fend for themselves for a while to go find that one, right? God's perspective the one is the mission. God's called you to be part of his restoration. The one is the mission. Christ said that. So if you look at a broken person and you don't see the mission of God, you don't have the heart of Christ, which doesn't mean you're not in Christ. You are. It means we need to change our hearts and develop Christ's heart for that person. 
There's a big difference there. Secondly, so God's restoring his relationship with the one who wanders away. That's you and me. Second part, check this out. Mark 9, 34 and 35. Mark 9, 34 and 35. I said we're going all over scripture here for a little while today, so be ready. So God goes out and he finds the one. Christ came, he dies on the cross, he restores his rela our relationship with him, but he doesn't stop there. He then starts working on our relationships with other people. Check this out, 9, 34 through 35. Sometimes you lose place no matter how many times you've looked at this. And they came to Copernicus. Now check this out. Watch the disciples' relationship with each other. People are broken. And when broken people start interacting with each other, what do you think results? More brokenness, right? And it gets worse and worse and worse. Ever been to a family reunion where everybody's out to get each other? Or a church where there are political battles and nobody's willing to give and love on the other people? It's not a place to be. It's not what God wants for us. So, check this out. As they, d they came to Capernaum, and they were, when they were in the house, Jesus asked them, so what were you guys discussing along the way? This is verse 33. But they kept silent, because on the way they had argued with one another over who was the greatest. <laughs> And he sat down and he called the 12 to him. Now check this out. Broken people, breaking on each other, trying to get a leg up on one another. Jesus' mission is what? Restoration. Check out what he does here. If anyone would be first, he must be the last and a servant of all. What did he just do? He took their brokenness, their desire to be the one, their desire to be lifted up. In the Jewish culture, the, the premier student is the one who would take over for the rabbi. He was the one who would be recognized. Everyone else is forgotten. The rabbi picks who is the greatest student. Jesus does what? There's infighting. They're not, all they want, they all want to be the one, right? What does Jesus do? He flips it on his head on them and he says, the key to your ascension, to being all that you want to be, will be to be the best servant in this group. So do you want to be the best, Daniel Bear? You will be the best at serving this church. That's how you rise. So now, to be restored, to be the one, my greatest goal is to find out what all of your needs are and serve you best. He flipped the brokenness. He flipped the fighting. He flipped the pride. He flipped the arrogance on its head and said, serve each other. So Jesus fixes our relationship with God and he's busy fixing inner relationships with each other. This is the mission of Jesus in the world. God wants to use you to help restore those relationships as well. So God knew we were gonna break our relationship with him, right? He knew that before he ever even created us. He puts a mission in place, he comes, he dies on the cross, but then he looks at his disciples, John 20, 21, and he says to them, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. That mission of restoration then follows through the rest of the New Testament. I want you to see this really quickly. Paul catches that vision. Turn with me really quickly to Philippians 4, 2 through 3. Philippians 4, 2 through 3. Now check this out. So, so there's this conception in America I'm going to get more, more specific. In the church, that the early church had it all together. They knew how to follow the Lord. They always were after the mission God wanted, and they all believed the same thing theologically. All of that is baloney. All of that. So if you think that because there are issues in your church, you're not in a good church, you need to read Scripture a little more carefully. Paul was constantly restoring 
broken relationships in the church. I'm going to show you three examples really quickly. Philippians chapter 4, 2 through 3. Now keep in mind, at this point in Philippians, he has called these people his fellow servants, his trusted people. He's prayed for them. He's praised them. Now what does he say to them? This is the mission of the church here that, that he gives them toward the end. I entreat Iodia and Syntacti to agree in the Lord. Meaning what? The church is broken. There are infights, right? Two women who are both godly servants of the Lord. He doesn't correct either of them, does he? Are having trouble getting along. It's like we see that in America every once in a while in our churches. He says, yes, I also ask you, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. They're Christians, they're fellow servants, and they're having trouble getting along. Whose job in these verses is it to help restore their relationship? Whoever the true companion is, right? And the whole church. Is that something that's going to be saved overnight, fixed over day? You're going to look at them and say, hey guys, Paul said to agree, so uh, problem solved, let's move on. <laughs> Good luck with that one. Guys, God's ministry of restoration is an ongoing thing within his body among those who have been restored partially because God has changed us, right? But now he's making us into his image, which means we're still broken inside, which means we still have a restoration that has to be developed. And when you get 100 people in the same room who are partially broken, what happens? Conflict. You're called to restoration. So instead of thinking, how do I fix that person because they're bugging me? Your thought process should be this instead. How is my brokenness playing into this issue? And how is their brokenness playing into this issue? And how do I promote restoration for myself, for them, and for us together? For the sake of a group, God is called to go do something that all of our brokenness could help keep us from accomplishing. It's a different mindset. When I go into an argument thinking, how do I help the restoration process along? I have to admit my flaws and move on for the greater good of something else that God wants to do, and suddenly I can overcome the issue that seemed so big when I started and insurmountable. One thing Paul has to do. Let's look at another one. Philemon 1, 8 through 19. Philemon 1, 8 through 19. If you don't know where that's at, go to Hebrews. It's the, next, it's the book right in front of it. Now check out Paul's masterful, and I mean masterful, attempt to restore a broken relationship. Listen to the way he words this. 8 through 19. Accordingly, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, he was, but now indeed he is useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending you my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me that he, in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be under compulsion but of your own accord. For this is perhaps why he was parted from you for a while that you may have him back forever, no longer as a slave but as more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you in the flesh and in the Lord? So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would me. 
First, you have two ladies fighting in a church who are both good and godly people, right? Now you have a runaway slave who is, by law, allowed to be killed, right, in this culture. He should be put to death for what he's done. What does Paul do? I saw Christ restoring the unrestorable. Based on that, please, Philemon, I have every right to tell you what to do, but please restore Onesimus and forgive him. Treat him as you would me so that we can be the people of God we're supposed to be. Did Onesimus deserve to be dealt with? Yes. But that's not what Paul asked for. He's trying to restore something outside. We are to be his agents in the world. And then last one, Galatians chapter 2, 11 through 14. Galatians 2, 11 through 14. I don't want to beat this point to death, so we're going to go one more here. I just want to show you, it's all over the New Testament. 2, 11 through 14. But when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, Paul, because he stood condemned. Peter head of the church by the appointment of Christ stands condemned. Why? Because when four certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically right along with him, so that Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you are a Jew, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force Gentiles? Gentiles to live like a Jew. Paul had to step into a church. He had to confront the leader of the church chosen by God and appointed by God to tell him, you are breaking the church. And what happened? God used his boldness, not his, Peter, you're no longer qualified to lead, right? That's not what Paul said. Paul said, you're leading the wrong way and it's destroying the church. And what did God do as a result of that? Peter repents, right? The church that used to be together and has pulled apart because the broken people are doing broken things, get put back together and realigned with what God wants, and as a group, they're able to move forward in ministry. God wants you to be that agent of restoration. So we need to catch that vision. God, and the third point on this, and then we're going to move on to point number two uh, for the sermon, but God is willing to pay the price for that restoration. We're looking at Christ, right? What was Christ willing to do to bring about this restoration? He was willing to leave his grandeur in heaven, right? Can you imagine being the world's leading CEO and stepping aside to clean bathrooms in order to help your, your bathroom attendants be what they should be when you know they're embezzling from you? This is what Jesus did. He went to people who were actively undermining and, and, and rejecting his leadership and got down with them and restored them. That's his active goal. So Jesus leaves that kind of grandeur. He comes to earth. He dies. He literally was willing to give his life for restoration. If you knew that God was calling you to walk into an area of town that you knew was dangerous, would you go because he's called you to be an agent of restoration? Or would you say, nah, that's okay. If a homosexual walks into a church needing restoration, how will you engage them? Christ sat with the sinners and helped them. Most Christians today don't follow that example. We do things slightly differently. Great example of being willing to count the cost. Um, how many of you have heard of Larry Merlot? I hadn't. So, and I say that, that's what I thought. Okay, so Larry Merlot is the CEO of CVS uh, Caremark, CVS stores all over the country, right? Their mission is restoring health. They were selling cigarettes. It was one of their primary options, right? So Larry 
years back says, our mission is restoring health. Our primary sale is cigarettes. These two do not go together. Incredible moment of brilliance, right? Where did the courage come in? Larry set, took cigarettes out of every CVS pharmacy. They lost billions of dollars in sales. And if you ask Larry as he went forward over the years, you know what he said every time? It was the right thing to do. Count the cost. If it's worth Christ giving his life, is it worth you giving up your comfort to help restore a relationship? Point number one, we've got to value and prioritize restoring relationships the way God does. So ask yourself, are you as interested in restoring relationships as God wants you to be? Second question, what relationships am I a part of that need to be restored? So I've done a great job just laying out a very simple, here's what God wants, right? But now let's get to the nitty gritty of it. You're in relationships, in this church, in your families, in your jobs, in your communities that need to be restored. Small towns are notorious for people holding grudges against each other in small communities. God says, I've called you to be an agent of restoration. What does that mean? You get to be like God. John 3, 16, God took the initiative. God went when they didn't deserve it. In this church, there may be, I don't know because I don't know you all well, which I apologize for, old things that have hurt, where people have hurt each other. Ways that we've undermined each other without knowingly. You are called to actively go and restore that relationship. Not to make yourself feel better, to restore it so this church can move forward as the body of Christ. The same is true in this community, in your families with the crazy brother or uncle who never does what he should and has hurt everybody around him, or the woman who's always gossiping and has hurt tons of people by what she has correctly or incorrectly shared with people when she shouldn't have. You're called to help restore those relationships. What is your role? Two parts. First, always look at yourself, right? What, where am I broken? I'll tell you, when I walked in here and my little brother had just died, I knew what it meant to be broken. But I learned more as I went along. I learned that I, I struggle to tell people in conversation exactly what I think. Why? Because I don't want to hurt their feelings. But as a result, there's no restoration. It's a family thing. And as a result, we can't go forward as a group. So I've had to learn, okay, is there a break in our relationship? First thing I do is look and say, was it my lack of communication? And then I have to go to them and seek restoration and a way forward so we can be what God calls us to be. That's what you're called to do as well. Secondly, who are you supposed to help do that themselves? Right? Because... I'll get to that in a minute. Don't worry about it. Um, others have restrained relationships. So here's one thing that's interesting. In a local church and in a body, the pastor is often called upon to be the one who initiates restoration between strained people, right, and strained relationships. I've got this miraculous insight from the Lord for you. You are called to be an agent of restoration. Whether you feel qualified or not, you are called to do that. Yes, that is part of the pastor's job description, but he's just being what God's called us to be, what God's called you to be. You are called to get on that. Well, what keeps us from doing that? Pride? My wife and I will get into fights, right? All of you who are married, who's, who's married in here? Okay. Have you ever been wrong? And the last thing you want to do is admit that you are wrong so that you can restore that relationship? Okay, funniest thing, my wife's not here so I can say this. Um, 
it is hilarious to me to watch my wife when she knows she's wrong and I know she's wrong and she knows I know she's wrong. Watch her face as she knows she needs to restore that relationship. But that would mean admitting that she knows she's wrong. And I, I, I'll just tell you right now, it takes me a lot longer to admit that than her usually, right? But it is funny because she's just sitting over there. I'm doing the same thing, right? But that's how it works. You've got to get rid of pride out of the way to move forward. They may be wrong. Guess what? We were all wrong when Jesus stepped out to restore the relationship. It's not like we had some part that was right, that made it okay, that made it worth Jesus coming. We were legitimately as wrong as could be. Didn't deserve it. Jesus said, I'm going to step in and actively restore this relationship because he prioritized it. So, sometimes it's pride, sometimes it's personal preference. I want to, but I would rather. How many times have you known God wants to do something in, in this church? I'm going to get really, really pointed here for a second. And you stayed home to watch Netflix, barbecue. That's a pretty good excuse, by the way. Um, watch football, which I love dearly. There are so many things where we sometimes we know God wants us doing one thing, but we'd rather be doing something else, right? So great example. I'm on the plane on the way back from Africa. We fly through Dubai. I had to sit next to an Arab guy. And I knew, I knew, I knew. Now, here's the funny part. I'm teaching salvation theology, right? I've been teaching it for a week and a half, in-depth, 45-hour course. Sits me next to an Arabic guy who turns out to be an Arabic apologist, a Muslim apologist. Now, I had the aisle seat. My mother-in-law was with me. My mother-in-law wanted to not sit by the Arab guy. Not in a bad way. She just, you know, she just wanted to relax and kind of turn inward, right? I paid for that aisle seat. Who ends up in the middle seat? Without a good attitude. I want to make that very clear. I was, had a very bad attitude about this. And I'm sitting there the whole time just trying, just, okay, I can just focus on my movie and not do anything, right? And what is God doing? The Arabic guy leans over to me and says, so do you have an interest in spiritual things? <laughs> How do you not say yes to that when you're doing what I'm doing, right? <laughs> Thus begins a four-hour conversation. You cannot witness directly to a Muslim because they will be offended and attacked. So I had to ask questions like crazy. Four hours later, I know the names of four Muslim apologists who I can look up online to see what they think about the doctrine of salvation because I talked to them about what I was doing. I know all these things, right? But I got to tell you, I spent the whole time wishing God would take the opportunity God just gave me away. <laughs> and I got done and while I was still mad that I lost my opportunity because I'm selfish and I would rather, I knew God put me there in that seat that I didn't want to be in to talk to someone I didn't want to talk to because he wanted me there. And that's one of the reasons I, I believe there's a lot of teaching in the church that says that you can't do God's ministry. God won't use you for ministry unless you're prepared and you have the right heart. And I say baloney Jonah. Right? Right? absolute baloney. I was Jonah, and God said, shame on you. Sometimes personal preference will keep us from doing this, and then insecurity. Do you guys have any idea how terrifying it is for the first five minutes of being on a stage in front of people? If I were to look at the insecurity, I would never do the ministry. But I know I'm called to the ministry. And I know God wants you guys to benefit from whatever he has to say. Do you know that when I started writing this sermon, I told a few people what I was writing about, and you know what they told me? Why would you teach that? John 3.16 again? And I kept going, no, I just think God has something to say out of this. He keeps bringing me back to this. So I started writing a message on Jonah. I text Brian, hey, 
Which sermon would you rather have? This one on this or this one on restoration? I'm going, pick Jonah, pick Jonah, pick Jonah. <laughs> oh, the one on restoration. Ah! <laughs> That's how you know God has something to say. <laughs> so... I hope this benefits you guys. I hope this resets the way we think. I hope it helps you guys grow the way it has me going through it because I realized if I get a radical, different understanding of what God wants me to be, to pursue as he restores me, and to give to other people as an ongoing mission to help restore them and to help teach them to restore other people, then my world begins to change. How does your life look as a father or mother in your home? If instead of stop it, start it, you saw yourself as the agent of restoration in your home at all times. How about this church? What would it look like if everyone in this church was looking for ways to help people be restored in their relationship with the Lord and each other at all times? A lot of the fighting goes away. A lot of the really dumb arguments go away. That's just how it works. So, point one, need to go where the broken live. The last two points are much quicker, so stick with me. Two, we need to go where the broken live. John three sixteen. where does the son go? He didn't go to the local church, did he? Technically, it didn't exist, so I know it's a bad example, but he went to the sinners, right? Do you know how many American churches would be huge or totally different in their impact? Who cares if you're a big church? If the people inside it did the same thing? God says, go into the world. I am sending you on a mission of restoration. Not do a very good job discipling each other, and uh, if they walk through the door, be very friendly. Right? Go. Radical restoration. When was the last time you went? Not just to be there. Now, check this out. This is a very interesting mentality. So, so Jesus doesn't sit in heaven until we come to him for restoration. Jesus doesn't look for neutral ground to meet and discuss restoration. That's how we like to do ministry, right? Well, if it's dirty and messed up over there, tell you what, I'll meet you at the mall where I can walk out of one of six exits at any time, right? And we will discuss terms for your involvement. Actually, Jesus says, go to the homosexual, sit with them, love on them, and help them be restored. Go to the, pe to the drunk father who has ruined his life and hurt and abused his family and help him be restored. Go to the mom who's struggling with pornography and do that. Go. Be my agent of restoration. I picked you. Whether you feel ready or not is not the issue. I said go. That's the difference. So, a couple examples of this very quickly. Matthew chapter 9, 9 through 12. Jesus cares more about people than perception. We're going back to Jesus, right? Because it's all about Jesus. Matthew chapter 9, 9 through 12. Got a couple more verses here, and then we'll, we're going to be... Going, but Matthew chapter 9, 9 through 12. Jesus was shamed publicly for spending time with tax collectors and sinners, right? By who? The religious people. 9 through 12, 9, 9 through 12. As Jesus passed from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in a tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And Matthew rose and followed him. And Jesus reclined at a table in the house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. They knew Jesus had a different mission than the religious leaders. They knew something was different and that they were welcome in that mission. 
And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, so uh, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Implication, your teacher is ignorant. Your teacher is unclean by the law because he's with these people. Your teacher is a fool. That's what they're saying. Jesus, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Christ came to restore the broken. If you're with the sinners, you're right where Jesus would have been. Don't let perception of the church as you go out, not to go to the strip club because you want to be there. That's not what it's talking about, right? This is Jesus going to where they're at to minister restoration to broken people. This is not an invitation to hang out and do whatever we want all the time. This is a looking for opportunities to go where they're at to minister. Totally different. But Jesus goes Paul was not swayed by public perception. Think about what we just read. Galatians chapter 2, right? Peter, public perception. Everything's going to go wrong. Peter, I'm going to look bad in the eyes of James and these, these Judaizers from the church. Right? So what's he do? He pulls back from doing the restoration ministry God's called him to. Paul, I don't care what it looks like. God calls us to restoration. This is where I'm supposed to be. Peter, how can you abandon what Christ showed us? Don't let public perception in the church or out of the church keep you from doing what God has called you to do through Christ. Keep going. So questions. Have you isolated yourself from the broken? Here's a question for the American church, and this is a really intriguing one. How many Bible studies do we do in this church? Our church does a couple on weekdays, right? Then we have Sundays. Then we have Wednesday night, right? Do we isolate ourselves from the broken? Because we're spending so much time trying to learn God's word and not actually fulfilling the mission of God in the world? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. I'm not here to judge that. Only you can look God in the eyes and say, am I being faithful on this, okay? Okay. This is not for us to judge each other. This is for self-evaluation and ministry evaluation. Could you name a place or a group of people you spend time with specifically to have a restorative impact on their lives? If you can't, how are you spending your time instead? Again, I love a barbecue. Bring people over. Are you more concerned with looking like a respectable Christian than seeking those out who need restoration? Are you more concerned with personal feelings of safety and comfort? Now, here's another one. Are you willing to admit where you are broken and let other people speak into your life to help restore you? Remember that pride thing? Here it is. Andy Stanley is one of my favorite quotes from Andy Stanley. It is awesome. So he says, I have been a part of every bad decision I have ever made. <laughs> Say that with me. I have been a part of every bad decision I have ever made. Which means you're broken and you need help just as much as I do, right? It requires me to admit my brokenness and it requires you to forgive me for it and to help me grow. And if I'm not willing to let you help show me where I'm broken and grow, guess what? I'm gonna stay the broken person I am and not move towards what God wants. One of the things that I hear so much among the youth and people my age is this utterly ridiculous statement. I don't need that kind of negativity in my life. You heard that? Christ is sending people to you to help you see your brokenness, to help you grow. And if you don't want to listen because you don't want to be told you're broken, you're going to stay a broken wretch. 
You might be a pretty good broken wretch, but you're still going to be a broken wretch, right? What did God want you to be and become that you never became because you wouldn't listen? What did someone else miss out on becoming because when you tried to do the same for them, they rejected you as though you hated them or didn't want the, didn't care about them by telling them the truth. Bible, Proverbs, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Restoration requires being broken and being open about it and being willing to move on. Last point. We need to remove hindrances, not sinners. Let that sink in for a minute. Jesus' first advent was about restoration, not condemnation. Guys, go back with me really quickly to John chapter 3, 16 through 17. We're just going to look at verse 17, but I want you to look at this as you read this. This passage, when I started, because we struggle as churches, right? How, when someone's living in sin, where's the line? Somebody walks in, they're living together with their spouse. You know there's an ungodly relationship. What do you do? What is Jesus' initial response here? What does it say? This time when Jesus came, what was he looking for? John three seventeen. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Letting people know they're a sinner is not the goal. The goal is restoration, right? So if your first deal is to look at someone and say, you're broken, how does that work with your spouse? How does that work with your spouse? Be honest. It doesn't, does it? How about your kid? You done messed up. What happens, right? They don't like you. They don't want to talk to you. Different approach. You're coaching a young guy in business. I think you're one of the most skilled men I've ever met, but I see something in you that might hold you back. Can I tell you what that is? What does that person do now? I'm affirmed, I'm validated, I'm skilled, I'm valuable enough for you to tell me something that would make you uncomfortable to tell me. I'm now listening. Restoration takes tact. You don't cut the person. You find a way to get the hindrances out of the way so you can help the person grow. That's what we're talking, that that's what Jesus does. So turn with me, John 8. 8 through 11, it's a couple pages over, 8, 8 through 11. This passage is one of the most telling, telling moments in Jesus' ministry what, because of the interplay that's going on here. 8, 8 through 11. You know what? Let's start, let's start um, in verse 3. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst, so they're circled around her, right? And she's in front of Jesus. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses commands that we stone such a woman. What do you say? Couple things. Are they wrong? She caught in adultery? Jesus doesn't dispute that, does he? Does the law say she should be stoned? Yes, it does. So are they wrong? They just missed the whole point of what God wants for them. That's all. But as far as their detailed exegesis, they're on the money. So what is Jesus' response? I love this. So Jesus said to that, to, they said this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, they're pressing him. He stands up and says, let the one who's without sin among you cast the first stone. Here's where it gets interesting. Who's the only person in that group who can cast a stone? The only one. They are correct. She is a sinner. They are correct. She is supposed to be stoned by the law of Moses. The only person with the right to throw a stone in that group 
is the one who's been asked to condemn her. What did we just read in John 3, 16? 17. I did not come to condemn this time, right? The only one with the right to condemn her holds her fate in his hand, as we often do as the body of Christ when a sinner walks into these row halls or when we meet them in the world. He bends down once more and starts writing, and when they heard what he said, one by one they went away. Now, here's my favorite little subline in this whole thing, beginning with the older ones. Do you want to know who knows they're broken? Those who've lived a long time and have had a chance to see how broken they are. Youth, we got a mission in life. We got a goal. I got some flaws, but that's not really the issue. The issue is what am I going to be and what am I going to do? By the time you get a little older, you start realizing that may all be true, but you're a messed up individual and that's why there are messes all over your life. And I love this because he says this. Who are the first people to walk away? The older men. Because they know it. And then slowly the younger men walk away. Bring it to the pinnacle of the story. Jesus stood up. No, Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Keep in mind, they were just surrounding her, demanding her life. Jesus stands up and looks at her and says, Woman, not, you're not guilty, it's okay, they're a bunch of jerks. No, she was guilty, right? Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She says to them, no one, Lord. And he looks at her and says, then neither do I. The only one with the right to condemn is Christ. He forgave that sin at that moment without telling her what she did wasn't a sin right he restored her and then what does he say now go and sin no more that is the ministry of restoration that is our call as the people of God in this world that's what we're here to do application very simple plan how we will approach the broken and engage the messed up realities we find one of the things that I've watched and grown aware of, in counseling they teach you, when somebody reveals something to you, this is not the appropriate response. <laughs> right? You do that, what happens? Instant wall, right? Two things. God removes the hindrance not the person, right? Colossians 2, 12 through 13, I believe, says that we were dead, not in the sense that a lot of people theologically argue. It says you were dead in the sense that your sin separated you from God like a wall was in between you. And Christ made you alive. It's not talking about the theological stuff. That gets into different. But he says he made you alive by removing the wall through his blood, restoration now you can come to the lord he removed the hindrance not the sinner that's what we're trying to do as the body of christ so will your shock at their sin communicate rejection will your method of interacting with them after the after the initial revelation of the sin Communicate that they're not good enough to be in your, your close group anymore. Jesus went where they were, sat with them, and ministered to them specifically because they were broken. That's your call. Your spouse is broken. That's where you should be ministering. Your parents are broken. That's where you should be ministering. Your church has a broken relationship. That's where you should be ministering. Your community has a broken issue. You should be there. Now, I say a lot of should because this is a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of effort. And let's be honest, there are things in life we can't do it all, right? But when God gives you a unique opportunity, that's where you're called to be. I'm going to close with oh, two things, uh, one more thing. Is your goal of restoration visible? Do they know why you're there? They knew why Jesus was there because he treated them in a way that was different. Because he had a different goal from the Pharisees. Think through what that means for you in ministry, but I'm going to close with this illustration of this point. 
Remove hindrances, not sinners. There's a husband and a wife that we're talking. And the husband explains to the wife that he has a friend who is addicted to pornography. And the wife goes off ranting about what a terrible person this guy is. How horrible is it that this person engages this way? And what could he do this to his wife? Is any of that wrong? Maybe, maybe not. But what did that reaction do? She then, the wife then looks at her husband after a while and says, Honey, if you were struggling, you'd tell me, right? <laughs> no. He literally laughed in her face and said no. Guys, our reaction matters. The ministry is restoration. Let's keep in mind the long-term goal when they're broken, they're broken. We expect brokenness. What we want to do then is help them see how valuable they are to the Lord and move them towards the restoration we are both experiencing and trying to help them experience. Thank you very much for having me today. I hope this encouraged and helped. It's a very simple sermon. Um, if, you, uh, if God does something with it, praise him. Let's pray and then I'm, well, I'll get out of here. Dear Lord Jesus, you are a blessing. You are amazing. This has been such a blessing. I, to be with your people and just preach your word. Lord, do, let your Holy Spirit do what it wants to on the people here. Help us to seek out people and relationships to work on the restoration in. And I pray that you'll go beyond any, any issues with my presentation um, and work on our hearts so that we can be your people in your world to do something only you can do through us. In your name, amen.